Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man who, just like myself, continues to put top shelf liquor into a bottom shelf body. Here is the captain. Yeah, get you some. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are very happy to still be sipping on some Bourbon County brand Bananas Foster from Goose Island Beer Company. This baby is packed with beautiful flavor. Ripe bananas, toasted almond, brown sugar, and cinnamon make this stout one to remember. Garage grade five out of five bottle caps. And a quick shout out before we get back into our Delphi discussion. I have a shout out to Shane Cosindine all the way over in Clare Castle, Ireland. And I also want to give a shout out to our friends down in Orlando who operate one of the very best breweries in the United States. A shout out to Doug, Chris, and Shiani and everyone working the brewery and behind the bar at Tactical Brewing Company. Tactical was very nice and generous to make an impactful donation to the Porchlight Project a nonprofit organization helping families and law enforcement with assistance in Ohio cold cases. For more information on delicious beer, go to tacticalbeer.com. And for more information on how you can help and get involved, go to porchlightonline.org. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, Beer Run. Make sure you check out truecrimegarage.com. Join our mailing list so you're in the know. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Richard Allen is charged with killing Abby Williams and Libby German. Allen confessed to murdering the girls to his wife while talking to her on the phone from prison. From prison. Allen confessed from prison. Well, and that's that's a great way to bring up the next topic, which is the the crime scene photo leaks. So all of that goes down late September, what we just discussed. And then it would have been early to mid October, right? That the photos get leaked out. We're all comfortable discussing this. I I believe that unfortunately, Fig, you were one of the persons that received some of this information. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was early October received crime scene photos and it's probably all of us we get stuff sent to us and you open things i didn't recognize the email but i've seen pictures and they're just all fake or didn't look like it but as soon as i opened this email up and it was 5 45 a.m i was woke up check my emails for work before i get ready head to the office right when i saw them i knew these were real and I immediately forwarded to Nick McClellan and said, hey, these were sent to me. This is where they were sent. I just, just first thing, emailed him, and then he gave me specific instructions, got right back to me. Here's, here's what I want to do. Um, we're trying to track down the source. And for anyone who, who wants to say anything about Nick McClellan, I'll tell you from my interaction with him, he cares about the family. He's, I live in a different time zone. That guy is responding to things. And, and I think the crime scene photos really hurt the defense. And maybe maybe a lesser man would have said, yeah, let them go out there because people are going to see him and they're going to hate Richard Allen even more. And it is going to persuade them to maybe convict him if they're on the jury. But he was, nope, he did not want those things out. And, and again, another reason why they sh- maybe the prosecutor might have wanted them if he was a lesser man to get out is because it disproves this Odinist theory. So once I received them, I, I sent them to Nick McClellan. I followed his instructions. And then, you know, it's, it's still upsetting, you know, about, about what, this, what this was. And then you get online, you know, I don't say anything. You get online, you see all these people claiming this Odinist stuff and there's horns left there. And, and I knew different. So I was like, what do I do here? Um, so I called Brett from the prosecutors. He was kind enough to call and just kind of give me some advice. I'm like, could I? Like talk about some of these things because I just, it doesn't sit right with me that these rumors are going out there and they're not true and people seem to be believing it. And I wouldn't challenge that. And so he, he gave me some advice. I was still, I, I think I called you guys and it's fine. All, 
all three of you guys kind of said the same thing. And I know you didn't think I would do this, but you're like, do not send me the photos. Brett said, I'm like, no, no. I mean, it wasn't even coming up, but it was just right away. You guys just put in this uh, preemptive, like, just don't send. I'm like, no, no. I'm like, I deleted them. I'm not going to. Like, okay, good. I just, I don't want to see those. All three of you said that. Um, Brett was like, no, I've seen way too many of that. So like, just please. I'm like, I don't, I don't have them. I delete them, follow instructions. So it was good. But I just thought that was, speaking of, you know, integrity and just the difference between these, some of these social media people were talking about earlier versus you two and Brett, where it's like, do not show me. I don't want any of that. Uh, just stating that up front. So, but I do, I, I thank Brett I, and I thank you guys for just kind of giving me uh, an opportunity to kind of talk and, and almost like de-stress about them a little bit because you guys covered way more cases than me um, and gave me some good advice and kind of let me talk, talk to you guys on the phone a little bit. And, 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 you know, you're exactly right. Like it was, that was the three of us that, you know, independently, that was our knee jerk reaction. Don't, whatever happens, don't send us the photos, you know, where my mind and my heart were at it. I simply want justice for Libby and Abby and me, my eyeballs seeing those photographs does not do anything to work towards that goal of getting justice for it. It, it does nothing for the case, but for getting justice for Libby and Abby. And so one, I, I knew I didn't need to see them. The other, the other kind of funny thing about this is when all of this stuff is taking place, you know, I'm getting a couple texts from you and I said, oh, by the way, funny, we're chatting now. I happen to be in Indiana. And so you said, you, you text me and he said, hey, not sending you anything, but I, you know, just want to, if you have time, I'd like to talk real quick. I'm at, I'm actually at a three day CSI training event with law enforcement, with a member with, with sitting in a room with 40 members of Indiana law enforcement, the only civilian in the room. And look outside of a couple cases that we've worked together. I don't know you that well, fig. I thought, holy shit, I got to get out of this room before, before my phone rings, uh, because I don't know what kind of conversation will ensue after I pick up very quickly. I run out to the uh, parking garage of this police department. And I think you ran outside as well, uh, wherever you were at the time. And we both had a quick chuckle about that. Our quick conversation was a confirmation of no, no Odinism, no ritualistic stuff seen at the crime scene uh, from, from what you saw um, that it, it just, it, it dispelled those rumors. And I was happy to hear that from you, uh, put a little smile on my face and I was, I was able to go on about my day. It, to me also, it confirmed something, a discussion that Becky Patty and I had at CrimeCon. And I want to be very, very clear about the very brief discussion that we had. I saw her walk into podcast row. I left my booth and I approached her. And I cannot say if she remembers who I am or not. Um, we we had spoke prior at one of the previous crime cons briefly with Becky and with Mike Patty. But it's very possible that she remembers you because you're very, very strikingly handsome. Oh, you, you used the exact words I was going to use. Yeah, um, strikingly handsome. Yeah. Some um, would say. Yeah, stunningly handsome. Stunningly um, handsome. Uh, and also classically handsome. But yeah. um, beyond that, None of, that's maybe. none of that's true by, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. But anyway, I said to her right away, and I started talking about the information that was coming out, this Odinism crap. And I saw a look of concern on her face. And, and that look remained until I said, Becky, I got to tell you, I, I'm no expert, but I feel this is really good for the case. And it's good, good for what we all want because it's all bullshit. And then the look of concern changed to a smile. And I, oh, I loved seeing that smile on Becky's face. And she, and I said, to me, it shows how desperate the defense is and that, it, that it shows their hand that they have nothing because every, everyone will read the headlines. Very few will read the 136 pages. And in those 136 pages, it tells you 
It tells you what this, this theory is a house of cards at best. And so I told her, I said, I, I hope that, that this case doesn't get delayed any further. I hope that the court proceedings don't get delayed any further. And this is what kind of good people we are talking about. The victims families are, they've been through the worst tragedy one could ever imagine ever. And she looks at me and she says, you, she goes, not only is that bullshit, she says, the biggest bullshit part is that there's been an arrest made and we can't even talk about the case. And what I mean to, to highlight her character, there's been a gag order placed on certain people in this case that they cannot discuss it. And while she has gone through one of the worst tragedies anyone could ever fathom, and while it took five and a half years to get an arrest in her granddaughter's murder. She is of the character that she will honor, even though she believes it to be bullshit and maybe even in a, in a weird way, cruel. She will honor that gag order. That's what kind of good people we are talking about. It makes a lot of sense because I've never spoken to her before. And then after I, I put out a, a YouTube video and she must have just watched it, but she sent me a message and it was kind of me trying to pick apart kind of the, this 136 page memorandum where she just, it was, it was short and sweet, but you know, it meant a lot. And she just said that I was a breath of fresh air. And so uh, I think just because of all the rumors and, and stuff that, that she hears going around, she just was glad that someone was inserting some logic into the, into the case. And it, it meant a lot because I, I never spoke to her and um, just that she reached out. It made a lot of the the work that we do that is, uh, you know, it's it's stressful sometimes. It's emotionally draining. But just hearing that someone appreciated something that I did, someone from the family, because I was putting myself in their shoes and just like, how would I feel? This was a, a fa family member. And then you hear about all these crazy things that happen to a loved one and yeah, it just seems like a lie and people are believing it. Like someone had to say something. And that's why I'm glad to be on your guys' show. And we're, we're discussing the case because they don't have a voice right now, like you pointed out, Nick. And someone needs to be the voice of logic. And I, hopefully we're, we're doing a decent job of that. And I think people forget, and we've covered so many cases, but to actually meet the family members of victims – Let's just take this case, for example. They're a victim. The family is a victim every day that somebody isn't arrested. And they went years and years. And every time there's a press conference, they're, they're victims all over again. Every time there's a, a change in direction by law enforcement, they're victims all over again. Then... There's an arrest made, so they get this small victory, but then all these other steps after that, they become victims all over again. And and that's what the defense team, and I, I believe this defense team has the idea, and this is just my gut feeling, is we're going to take this case because uh, there's national popularity. We're going to take this case because we're local. We're going to muck it up. We're going to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And our end goal is to write a book, try to get a movie made or some documentary made. And and that's how we're going to profit off this. And that's that's my personal gut feeling about the defense team. It, it sure seemed that way. It's reading the transcripts from the October 19th powwow where it was the judge talking to the defense attorneys and that came out. It just seemed like the defense lawyers, they really cared about themselves more than their client. And in, in that conversation, it seemed like the only person who was really concerned about Rick Allen's rights was the judge, judge goal. So I, I get what you're saying there. They made it very much about themselves and it seemed like they enjoyed the spotlight and, and just wanted to, yeah, maybe even write a book or, do something afterwards, but it didn't seem like their heart was into the case. Well, and I think some of that is, look, I, I will defend the defense here briefly, you know, because I've said on record multiple times with, with OJ's defense, 
with Jose Baez from uh, Casey Anthony. If I am sitting in the defendant chair, that's what I want my defense team to do, to to question everything. Um, and unfortunately, in both of those scenarios, it the result was successful. I hope and pray that it's not in this situation. So I'll defend them in that regard. Now, where I where I will go and agree with you guys 100%, I think some of the evidence to back up your suspicions is the photo. The photograph of Richard Allen that come, came out with him in jail, and it looks like he's got he spit up on his shirt, and he's sitting in a very odd, weird-looking manner, and he's kind of he's got the crazy eyes. I do not believe for one second that is the only photograph they took of that man that day. They, I think they took dozens of photographs and thought, you know what, what's the one where he looks the, where the, what's, where's the one that's going to send off the bells, right? We, where is the photograph that people are going to go, holy crap, what the heck is going on there? Again, it's not just, it's not just our guy is innocent. It's our guy's now a victim. And here's the other thing. When we talk about the defense team collecting alternate theories and going to YouTube and going to websites and going to podcasts and trying to find those, I hope and pray that they spent the 20 hours that True Crime Garage released on these this case and, and, and went after the 20 hours, looked at each other and went, well, that was a waste of a few days because on our show, the the things that we kept circling around from day one was that this is a sexually motivated crime. Uh, the the arrest of Richard Allen and the crime scene photographs and everything else that's come out since then would say that that is factually true. Uh, that it was someone with a great knowledge of the Delphi area that probably lived in Delphi. Uh, with the arrest of Richard Allen, if in fact he is the one that killed those two girls, then that is true. And that the the suspect probably lives close to the Monon High Bridge. The arrest of Richard Allen, and if in fact he killed those two girls, would also prove that one to be true. So we didn't give them any ammunition on our show. Everything we were we were saying from Jump Street really pointed to someone like Richard Allen. Now, did it point did it point to hundreds of other people as well? Yes, of course. Uh, we didn't know his name until he was arrested. But Captain, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the one thing that we pointed out also. And it, and it wasn't our theory, but we liked the the theory of that there was an eyewitness that law enforcement probably had some communication with that they were identifying as eyewitness and not as a suspect. And I still think that theory with the arrest of Richard Allen holds true. Exactly right. Richard Allen at one point may have been in the witness, potential witness category, and then eventually found himself in the suspect category. And we also said that there was probably an, an attempt, the attempt of an abduction and simply moving the girls off of that bridge, off of that trail, taking to them to where they were found. That is the definition of an abduction. And then circling back to some of the Odinism things and, and things found at the murder scene or witness statements, if this truly was something that was committed by some type of cult or, you know, some kind of ritualistic murders that does not gel with the witness statements that were there on the trails that day. The witness statements were that they'd seen a a disheveled man, a muddied man, a a potential bloodied man, someone who looked at like they had been in a fight, a single individual rather than all of this ritualistic nonsense that here we are, having to spin our tire. The the next item is that we end up November 22nd, 2023, Indiana State Police, they arrest Mitchell, Mitchell Westerman, age 41, in relation to this evidence leak that came out. And unfortunately, too, there was another individual that, that took his life. Westerman, he at one time worked for Andrew Baldwin's office. So he's a former employee. And it seemed like they still stayed in pretty good contact with each other. And the claim was that he went in early summer and he went into the office because Baldwin was using him to possibly pick holes in the defense strategy that they were coming up with. 
but I know it happened more than just this one time being that I was getting fed some, some stuff that ended up being true. That was coming from the defense side of things. But so he allegedly took some pictures uh, that were there in a room that should have been locked and that, and these uh, photos of the crime scene should have been kept away in, in a locked cabinet as well. So the story they put out is that he took a few of those pictures. Then, um, don't know if people know this, but Robert Fortston, his family calls him Kyle. They, um, Mitch, is they were best friends. They were extremely good friends that he sent them to, to Robert. And the reason it is kind of unknown, like I was, I, I knew Robert Fortson, the gentleman who, who took his life uh, through Reddit and some of his YouTube comments that he made on my channel. A uh, very smart guy. Uh, he was into true crime. He was interested in the story and he probably just, you know, talking to his best friend, that guy, Mitch, shared some pictures with him. And then I know that Robert Fortson, he would, he would post things on, on Reddit and uh, not try and give too much, but I mean, it goes back to the social media. I mean, he was kind of getting bullied for things that he was saying. Uh, and they're like, you don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong. And I think he kind of just had enough where he's like, no, this is, look, I, telling the truth this is this is what happened so he started being more blunt about things and then they kind of him and this this other person that he sent it to to kind of prove some things to um posted a, a tree a picture of a tree that looks like uh could be an f but when you kind of look at it and in different lights it, it looks more like either someone wiped their hand like a gloved hand or a, a splatter it doesn't look like an f a, a and, tree with a tree with something on it a uh, blood right uh on it and some were saying it might be an f other people just saying right. it's a smear it was left to open to interpretation right right and why the f is important is because the defense tried to call it a odin rune and they actually used the wrong f in the 136 page memorandum the f the it would have been facing the other way for the one that they used i forgot the name of it but i, I looked it up so yeah they they called it the wrong type of f so that's, that's what they, they were using. Um, and that's what got put out was first that photo. So that was kind of the first leak was talking about the Odinism stuff. The second leak was this F tree. And then the third leak was the crime scene photos themselves. And that is what Westerman said he took pictures of. He sent it to his friend, Robert Fortson, who sent it to another person. And then now the chain now it just, it spreads out. I mean, you send it to a few people. It, Things get out there and um, someone decided to uh, take the picture once they received it and come up with some fictitious emails and phone numbers and just send it out to a bunch of people. And their reason was they claimed that, well, they didn't want people to make money off of it. And I don't know, they thought it, it should be out there, which is just disturbing. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how how that all went down. And I don't want to go too far down this road because I think it's disrespectful, but to include the audience in this conversation and some information that you really didn't want to have uh, fig, I'll give a brief description of one of the, of a photograph that I did not see, but my understanding of that photograph. And I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, one of the more talked about photographs as far as the crime scene goes, would depict the two victims lying near one another, probably feet apart and both slightly covered with sticks or branches. One, one victim in a state of undress, one victim appears to be mostly dressed. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And so, and here's the thing too, like, unfortunately, well, it's both fortunate and unfortunate. Fortunately, True Crime Garage has been around a long time. Unfortunately, during that long time that the garage has been around, we've reviewed a lot of descriptions and photographs of different murder scenes. And I am here to tell you that in my experience, and and and, and you look, I get it. I'm just a, I'm just a podcaster at the end of the day. But also at the end of the day, I've probably reviewed more crime scenes or murder scenes than your local cop or local detective 
just given the nature of our show and that we've covered so many cases and we're not limited to one jurisdiction. I am here to tell you in almost every outdoor murder scene that I have seen or read a description of, the victim is almost always covered with some form of debris, leaves, sticks, what have you. It's all there's always some lame attempt by the perpetrator to conceal the body before fleeing the scene. And so I think a lot of people are making a mountain out of a molehill here with with the this idea of the sticks or how how the victims were found. Right. And a, a point to be made about these photos, there's probably a thousand, maybe 2000 crime scene photos taken. This is one photo, a snapshot. I know there's a few that got released, but they're right after each other. So say one photo, one snapshot in time. And if you look at a, a timeline through the day, we don't know what else was there. Really? We don't know if, if there were extra leaves on that got removed. I mean, they, it seemed like the pictures were hand selected. They chose these for a reason to maybe get them out there or to show a friend to, to even try and prove a point to their friend. Like, look, I told you it's, it's Odinistic. So they took them the picture that might look the most like Odin was involved, even though it wasn't. I mean, things would look a lot different if those branches were there and then they had leaves on top of them. It would, you'd, you wouldn't question, you wouldn't even think about Odinism. You just think like you said, oh, they're just trying to conceal it. But since there were no leaves on top, yeah, they maybe it looked a little like it was staged a certain way. So we don't know enough. Even even seeing a picture, just one picture out of the thousands, it gives us a little information, but it doesn't tell the whole story. We should also note that Richard Allen was moved from the Westerville Correctional Facility to the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility on December 6th. There are some people that are reading into that. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to fully understand why he was moved or when or why he was moved when he was moved. But I will say this from my understanding is the Westerville Correctional Facility, one, it, it was requested by his defense at one point that he that he would be moved that they hoped that he would be moved and two i it, it appears that the westerville correctional facility is getting ready to or or is in the early stages of a, a complete rehaul they're revamping the whole uh facility from my understanding and this is a big undertaking that will require likely require the movement of not just this particular inmate, but many others. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we don't know the actual reason there's that, which seems the most logical. There's also safety concerns. And we brought this up earlier about even the guards who will threaten child killers or people uh, who were just even uh, accused child killers. Well, we have to remember he did admit five or six times that he killed the girls. And so I think that's when things might've got kicked up a notch when other people hear other prisoners maybe heard that and start threatening him more like, Oh, this guy, he admitted to it. Like this guy saying that he did it. So it could have made things even more dangerous for him where they're moving him for his safety. We don't know. I'm just assuming. Then we have this case that is, you know, it's gone on for far too long as, as I described in my conversation with brief conversation with Becky, but now we have the Richard Allen court proceedings that are just filled with so many different twists and turns. So, and this is very convoluted and I, I think I have a decent understanding of this, but I think we should talk through it because this is, this is a huge deal in this case. Uh, this might be the biggest thing that's come out. Forget Odinism. Forget the leaked crime scene evidence. This photos. This this is the biggest thing in the case, as far as I'm concerned, since the arrest of Richard Allen. Okay, so we have to start down this long winding road here. 
So Richard Allen's defense team, you could word, word this a few different ways. They get fired from the case. They withdraw from the case. So just before the October 19th hearing in Allen County, Judge Francis Gull announced that the defense team members, Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rossi, had withdrawn from the case, thus leading to another announcement that the trial date. So originally we, we were thinking, anticipating this thing would go to some kind of trial January of 2024. So the judge then announces that that's going to be highly unlikely, seeing how the defense team just got either withdrawn or thrown out. Weeks later, a jury trial date for the double homicide case was then scheduled for October 15th to November 1st of 2024. So now we have a court-appointed counsel for Richard Allen. This is Robert Scremen and William Labrado. From my understanding, attorneys Baldwin and Rossi, they withdrew after special judge Francis Gall cited, quote, gross negligence by the attorneys in the representation of Allen. So Richard Allen's attorneys later say that they did not voluntarily withdraw from the case, that they felt that they were being forced out. Like the, I, I believe what they were either hinting at or outwardly just announcing was that in chambers, they were, it was a bit of a come to Jesus talk with, with the judge. And it sounds like they are claiming that the judge threatened to publicly uh, discredit them and, and to discredit them as, as dis, uh, defense attorneys and, and for their gross negligence in this job. And they felt that, that no, they had no other means other than to withdraw to save some face here. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds what happened. And maybe it was a mistake that she allowed them to save face because now we have the Supreme court case, but yeah, during that, that little powwow and hearings that they had, she basically showed them the statement that she was prepared to read. They they knew what they were there for, and they did withdraw. They weren't happy about it. Well, Rosie wasn't, didn't seem very happy about it, but he's like, fine, I will, because I feel like you're forcing me to. But they technically did both withdraw. Um, and then it's back to the captain's statements about, they. I think they want to be in the limelight involved, so they're going to, they're going to do something to, to make this thing prolong and still stay in the spotlight. But yeah, so judge goal basically uh, let them withdraw and yeah. And here, here we go. So this will be a huge deal because in on January 18th at 11 AM, we will have these, what's been described as oral arguments correct? And this will be a chance for the Indiana Supreme Court to decide on a couple of different things. One, should these two attorneys still be allowed to represent Richard Allen? And two, should special judge, appointed judge Francis Gull be allowed to oversee the trial? That's my understanding of it. I, I'm not great. I'm really great fig on when it comes to these investigations and finding the bad guy not so good about the court stuff from what i gather here is that they actually have the ability to they don't have to rule one way or the other they they could rule to leave francis gall as the judge they could rule to leave these two attorneys as representatives of richard allen or they could keep one and not the other, or they could toss both out from my understanding. Yeah. And, and luckily you guys introduced me to, to Brett because I, I'm the same way. This is not my background. So I'll, I'll text him rant questions like, Hey, could you explain this? And he's, he's great about explaining it in simple terms so that I understand it. But yeah, the January 18th, the uh, court, the oral arguments, it is those two things, like you stated, to reinstate the previous defense to see if they're going to bring back Baldwin and Rosie, and then to see if they're going to remove the judge to see if she was been acting, if she was biased towards uh, the, the former legal team for Rick Allen. So that's what they're going to decide on. And it was recently announced that this will be live streaming, that people will be able to live stream this January 18th, 2024 cameras in the courtroom. For some people, they love this to witness this kind of stuff. For others, most of the time, and this is part of the reason why I'm not so up to speed on the court stuff. One, because 
every jurisdiction, every state is different. So it gets a little convoluted in that manner. But two of these are oftentimes very long, drawn out, boring processes. I am incredibly eager to see the ruling that we end up with, who's allowed to stay and why, and who's removed and why. But this is, as I said, I believe this is the biggest bit of news in this case, January 18th, what they decide this January about this case since the arrest of Richard Allen. And then we have to see after the fact, does that mean that we're able to keep the same timeline of having a jury trial either, you know, sometime late October? I'm not very confident in that. I think that we're probably going to end up with a early 2025 trial, which is going to add to more messiness on social media. But um, I don't know. I So I guess my question for you, gentlemen, are would be, are you pro camera or against the cameras being involved in not just this trial in the proceedings, but others? I don't think that they fully determined that cameras will be involved in the actual jury trial yet. I think that will be decided later. But Captain, we'll start with you. Are you pro camera in the courtroom or against it? I'm all for it. I mean, I think it just everybody has a right to a, a, a fair trial. I don't know if necessarily, I don't know if necessarily, it should be live stream. But I think every every action that we can, as far as the the procedures and, and when somebody is arrested, if we can have the body cam footage during um during a search uh, of an uh, individual's house videotape it videotape people when they're in prison videotape every single courtroom proceeding i don't know if and uh, then we at least have that as evidence later i don't know if necessarily every case should be live streamed though yeah for my personal just kind of interest in seeing i definitely would like to have it live streamed so that i could see it i was a little uneasy just looking at some other cases where it seemed like they made mistakes with the live streaming like they showed the audience things that they weren't supposed to and it kind of and it it might have pushed back the case even further so i guess my fear for the case is as long as there's not a, a mistrial because of some mistake that was made through the live streaming but I guess the one thing that's good about it being pushed back and if they are planning to live stream it, then I guess they need to spend this time to make sure they have things dialed in with the cameras, you know, how to pan away, how to, how to set everything up and, and practice it, air proof it so that it doesn't prolong this case anymore. So if they, if they have it figured out and it won't impact the case, then I'm, I'm all for it. And I like, and I like captain's thought on maybe it doesn't have to be live. So that'll give them some, editing just in case and then yeah by all means show it all and the things that the public sh shouldn't see then make sure that they don't see them but yeah I, I think i think we should see what's what's going on i think we're all on the same page with this one here guys and in, in our thoughts and feelings about the cameras and and here's look i traditionally i believe in for the most part a case-by-case -case basis but we've we've regularly discussed here in the garage the complications when you have a case where you have either a confession or a complete denial when interrogating or questioning a suspect or even potential witness by detectives or law enforcement, when you, when you don't have camera footage of those conversations, as opposed to when you do have those where we can look back and go, you mentioned context earlier, Fig, and that's where you go. Okay, well, we we don't know. Okay, here's the words on pay, paper. We've all discussed with our friends and family the difficulties that texting can create in conversation because there's no there's no face to face. There's no oh, was he joking? I I, I hope he was joking because this sounds a little rude or a little out of character. But when you have the camera footage, you are able to pick up on a lot of other things. In this case, I'm all for it. 100% because look how mucked up this case is already from the public. I want to be clear from the public that I think that transparency will be the key in this case. And I think oftentimes in most cases, transparency is the key. 
And I'm with you guys. I don't know that it necessarily needs to be live stream. I share Fig's opinion out of my own selfishness that I'm happy that it will be live streamed. But I think that in this case, it's necessary. And we all know anybody, even even we've agreed that we don't have a great understanding of, of court proceedings and, and what the way that these things should play out in the courtroom. But I think one thing we all can agree on and everyone in the public should be able to easily agree on is that the court record is of the highest importance in all of these court proceedings. That's why you have the court reporter there. That's why you've had a court reporter there since before cameras existed. Somebody to chronicle and document what is said, what evidence is put forward, when, how the how the judge, uh, you know, it all gets into the record. And you, we, we see it in these courtroom dramas. Strike that from the record. It's so important what that record looks like at the end of the day. A camera in the courtroom can only further that court record and, and add context to that court record. So at the end of the day, what we should be pushing, always pushing forward as far as the public is concerned, the public should always be pushing forward that. It's not about getting a conviction. It's about getting the right conviction. And and the more things that we can do to police each step, th- then we'll know for certain that we got the right conviction. Yeah, well said. Yeah, it's uh, we want we want the truth. We want if the I have nothing against Rick Allen. I don't, I don't know him. I'm not going after Rick Allen because I don't like him. I'm going after whoever killed Libby and Abby. And it seems that this person who admitted to it, that he likely did. So hey, if it's not him, then I don't want him punished. I don't, I don't want anything. So yeah, transparency is great. So we can understand the full situation and maybe, maybe the transparency to your guys' point will help with some of this social media madness and once they hear things in context and learn all the facts, maybe they'll just move on to another case or, or drop it and just let the families be at, at peace. So I, I think transparency at this point could, could only help. Well, and in the case against Rich Allen, Rick Allen, we have actual physical scientific evidence that would suggest that he is the perpetrator of this heinous crime. We want to wish everybody a happy new year. Hopefully 2024 is the best year yet for you and the best year yet for the garage. If you're digging what you're listening to, make sure you subscribe and make sure you tell a friend. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? We're going to give you some recommended viewing for your eyeballs here. For more on Delphi, Richard Allen, Odinism, and even an interview with a former FBI agent, go to YouTube and check out and subscribe to Fig Solves. That's Fig Solves at YouTube. We will also be featuring one of Fig Solves' videos on our website, truecrimegarage.com. And you can also click on our recommended page and see all of our recommendations there. I want to thank everybody for the support onward and upward. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.